Yendo Sync, October 25th, we have an announcement and man, I've forgotten all the words. ZB's talking first and then I'll take a turn. Okay, so quick announcements. Uh, we have officially published the earliest possible version of the Webpack plugin for Lava Mode. Uh, it's yeah, it seems to work, uh, and now we're looking for people willing to try it. Uh, we have one group willing to try it internally in MetaMask, and that's the Snaps team. Uh, they uh, have a fairly simple setup where they initially used Webpack and then switched to Browserify for Lava Mode, so they are probably keen on switching back. Um, yeah, that's the announcement. Uh, if you want to participate in the trial or get someone to participate in the trial, uh, there's a discussion in the Lava Mode repository on GitHub. Uh, it's the only discussion on that repository. Uh, and that's where people can report back for uh, help and or results. Uh, that's the announcement. Great. Now the uh, on that uh yep send me send us a link at some point for something we can boost in sure mastodon or something okay i am in the never webpack camp myself <laughs> <laughs> but i hear lots of people can't get away from it so i'm sure i'm sure yeah. someone interested well uh Webpack it might be easier to sell to people than Browserify nowadays. Almost certainly. <laughs> All right. So yeah, I'll share uh, some links. And uh, the discovery, uh, that's actually really funny because uh, I built um, <clears throat> I built the policy support in Compartment Mapper and then put attenuation in there and uh, ended up with an implementation where you give a specifier for an attenuator in the policy and that gets imported and never connected the dots uh, that something I implemented later, which is an import hook for exit modules and changing how exit modules are handled uh, means you don't actually have to ship your attenuator as uh, a package in your dependencies. You can have uh, an attenuator uh, that's a function reference created at runtime, and then you can pass it uh, as a field on a namespace in the modules uh, object uh, on uh, the options for uh, import location and it's going to work. So I, I I got to that realization today and thought I will announce it because I remember saying that uh, uh, it's a limitation to how attenuators work that you currently have to uh, provide a string specifier that points to a dependency uh, and everyone bought it but it's actually not the case. You can have uh, you can have attenuators created at runtime uh, in the topmost scope uh, before you call import location, and it's going to work. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, on the one hand. Honestly, I have no idea how to feel about this. It sounds good-ish. Oh, well, it provides some convenience because you can uh, share a reference uh, from the outside uh, into the attenuator itself, because otherwise the attenuator is going to run uh, in a dummy compartment that's created for the purpose of running attenuators. Uh, inside of your uh, application. On the other hand, uh, your attenuator will 
uh, have access to the outside world potentially and not sit in a compartment, which is not great <laughs> in some cases, especially if it's vulnerable. So uh, I still think it's better to have uh, attenuators run in the compartment uh, instead of defining them on the outside. Uh, but now we know we have options. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that they correspond to the same options and trade-offs as with other exit modules, right? Um, yeah. It sounds it sounds it sounds right. Uh, the, the you as the host are empowered to make this decision, and that's the important yeah. thing. Yeah. Cool. The uh, I have one substantial pull request open, and it's taken me a a while to concoct it. But the upshot of it is that the pet demon will soon have the ability to um, do partial restarts, if you will. The idea is that it's currently possible to run the endo restart command right now, which throws away all closure state and all workers of all worklets of all caplets, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, then cause, and then causes the reincarnation of all of those objects when on demand um, to, to recreate to, to run through all of the code that was necessary to create the original permission object graph uh, or capability object graph as it were the thing that the the thing that is in review today is a change that makes it possible to do a partial restart which is to say starting with this pet named object um, throw away that object and all of its dependencies such that if they're ever needed again they have to be reconstructed um, this required lifting up the entire daemon onto blocks and then creating an envelope object and a terminator graph and yada, or terminator dag, whatever. Um, all of which would have been eventually necessary anyway. So I'm actually really happy with this, but the, uh, yeah, in any case, there is now an endo kill command, which will nuke an object and everything that has ever depended upon it, um, including any, any guest that has ever um, received, a, 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 has ever given a capability out as a response to a request or um, adopted an edge name. The, um, yeah, and so progress is being made. The, this, is, this has implications because this means that we can now create formulas for live reload and, um, and but but the reason I'm doing it is because I want to be able to have a sensible, easy semantics for connection loss. Uh, connection loss over CAPTP would imply the invalidation of um, any object that had that had been created over that connection. So if you ever needed again, if you ever needed an object that was obtained from a remote peer, you would have to reconnect. And all of the connection logic would be him uh, behind the scenes. Uh, who calls? Who gets to call the kill? The the creator. The the host has the kill capability. Guests do not have a kill capability. I see. Yeah. So I I can't kill myself, for example. If you were granted that capability, you could. Uh, by, by default, I do not get the kill capability. That's okay. right. <laughs> That's right. No, yeah. The the kill method currently will only exist on the host powers object. Um, and if it and like all methods of the host powers object that are potentially mirrored on guest powers, um, one of the one of the likely answers is that the guest would be able to ask the host. Like the, the kill method would induce a, a message to the to the to the host, whether you want to allow them to kill a thing. I, 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 I'm just going to add, this is apropos of nothing. I really like that pattern. I think that that is a very nice pattern. I, I, I haven't seen that captured explicitly elsewhere, but I, I did notice it. Which pattern? The uh, guest does not have a capability, calls the capability anyways, and then gets a message sent to the to the parent to say, 
your 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 baby wants this yeah 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 the, the being said i think it actually would be reasonable yeah it, i think it would be very reasonable to provide um an auto abort capability um to certain in certain cases um uh, right i am definitely going to make it so that you can observe that you that you're it will you will be able to observe your teardown signal for example <laughs> it, it might also be possible to it was, it, I don't ever forget seppuku or harakiri, <laughs> whatever we wish to call auto abort. Um, uh, I have wanted this. It might be necessary to add it. And it, if you have an, a notion of why we wouldn't, that'd be useful, I suppose. Uh, so the only related, I don't have a reason why you should not do this. Uh, the only thing that comes to mind is uh, so Java, Java has finalizer methods where you're told that you're about to be collected, uh, but the finalizer is able to link the, the this object back to something else in the graph, and uh, and then and then because they realize that that was a mistake, the finalizer only runs once. So. You can you can be garbage collect you can be told that you are being garbage collected, but you can only be told that once, even if you rescue yourself from being garbage collected. I think that that is a mistake. Don't do that. Uh, yeah. But I, I I think in general, being told that you are about to be killed, but not allowing the object to do anything to rescue themselves, I think that that is fine. Yeah, that that I will need to reason through. Um. I I, uh, I I wrote a uh, transformer for AST objects that transform everything into, so transforms everything into the finalized method. And then the program only runs when the root object is disconnected. I was very proud of that. It meant that you were not subject to any thread restrictions because your entire program actually ra ran inside the GC thread. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Being able to observe that you have been, uh, yeah, your own termination amounts to, in this case, that it's an, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a promise resolution for one. Um, I think that I'm currently toying with the idea of it always being a rejection. Um, but the, uh, so that it can convey a reason. Um, the um the upshot of it is that i have not done the work of doing garbage collection in pet demon yet but a design is emerging um where uh formulas are retained and values are retained and they're they're retained differently because values are there are there is a possibility of concurrent um, uh, instances of a value given that you can kill a thing and I and I'm still working so please while reviewing one of the things that you might you might want to provide feedback on is whether I should prevent the instantiation of a new incarnation of a pet named thing until the until the terminator has settled for the previous um and i'm not sure whether that's necessary but one but but the uh, one of the things that's uh, that is definitely going to happen is uh, apropos of you've been informed that you have that you have been uh, dereferenced <laughs> uh uh, and, and that, that there may be a new incarnation of you coming up at the same time, even possibly, is that uh, the yeah I'm not I'm not sure whether it's I have to think through whether it's possible for them to attempt to retain themselves again. I don't think that they can because that would amount to. That could, I think, that re would require a cycle in the pet, uh, the pet name DAG, but I'm not sure. 
Um, the, I mean, they can certainly send a message. Uh, they can certainly send messages, right, at that point. Yes. Yeah, yeah. They could send a message with the pet name of themselves, but the pet name would refer to the new instance um, because the because the cache because the memo has already been invalidated. So they, yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. They could do that. They could send, but they can only refer to themselves by name, and that's the that's the kicker. Um, but it, it's also true that a consequence of having been released is that the garbage collector could then release all of uh, the formulas, and if it was necessary. Uh, it, and that could imply releasing the worker that they were evaluated in, in which case they would be very abruptly terminated. <laughs> is there a defined is there a defined order in which the notifications occur? Um, we're still riffing at this point. Because right. um, that that's I think that that's another source of uh, confusion, right? Because if you notify the if you notify the parent before you notify the child that they are dead. Oh, I, I, this this I think it requires some thought, the, I, and then the, you might have cycles too. In in the current implementation, I have gone to extraordinary effort to ensure that when something is invalidated, it and all of its transitive dependencies are invalidated in the same turn of the event loop in the daemon. Um, but apart from that, the promise the promise resolutions are synchronous. Whether the promises are observed in any particular order is not defined, and probably can't be because they're observed in different workers over different CAPTP connections. This this feels like something that work has been done in, but I do I am not familiar with that work. Is the, the pattern is very consistent with what Go does with its contexts, um, for what it's worth. Uh, Go has a context object that is used for communicating for one. It serves two purposes. It's very similar to the async context that uh, that Justin Ridgewell is, is championing for JavaScript, that uh, Mark graciously put a great deal of time and thought into making sure it main, maintained a suitable um, Object Capability Foundation, um, which again, thank you. Um, the uh, and the other thing that it does is carry cancellation and deadline information. Um, so if you uh, the, basically in Go, it's idiomatic for the first function and enforced by their linter that if you have a context object, it must be the first argument. It's, it's sort of their answer to async. Instead of having async functions, you have Go routines on this context object that is conventionally the first argument. Then the context object is uh, is an arbitrary key value store for one, which is what it, why it resembles the async context object. Um, but it also has this deadline function, which has which returns the analog of a promise in Go, so you can observe whether you've been canceled, and you can do so synchronously or asynchronously. And then the um, and then you have and the context constructor can be con you can construct a context from another context with a timeout um, or a or a new deadline and um, the the neat thing about doing RPC in Go with these contexts is that you can put headers on the wire for your uh, your time to live essentially um, which can be synthesized from a context and then re-synthesized on the other side as if no time has elapsed on the wire, but you get a new deadline nonetheless. Um, and that can be used for load shedding and stuff like that. This is um, analogous, I think, to being able to have additional arguments on the E function in our eventual ascend for being able to express things like context and deadline or having those parameters conveyed behind the scenes by an async context. Um, so a lot of stuff we could do in the future.
that's all I've got other than uh, I, I, I've stuck Aaron with the review for that and I've continued to go on to attempt to implement um, P2P, uh, which is starting with just TCP connections uh, since that's the next thing that's unlocked. And there are two, there are true, two prongs to that effort. We need to convey, come up with a system for a notion of services, which would be a caplet that's responsible for both making, uh, accepting inbound connections and making outbound connections. And then the next step after that is coming up with a system for creating invitations and accepting them. So when you create an invitation, it would consult the list of active services, services that are running in order to construct addresses that your peer can use to connect back to you. Um, and then create a document that you can share out of band. And then the, and uh, then, yeah. yeah, I just, just the use of the term invitation. This is completely different than the ERTP level invitation used by Zoe, right? It is a different thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. It just, just, so just caution about, um, uh, avoiding name collision within things released by the or identified with the same organization. Just yeah. Yeah. Um, I went with invitation on the precedent that Brian did the same thing for Magic Wormhole. Um, ah. There's, there's a, <laughs> which isn't the same organization. <laughs> I, I, I concede. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, better better names pending. Yep, yep. Yeah, the way Magic Wormhole works is that you um, take some asset on your disk and then run a Magic Wormhole command on that thing, and then it will give you on. I forget what the magic wormhole command is. It might actually not may not actually be called invite. Um, you know, in any case, you get you get a a very short phrase that you can copy and then give to a give out of band to somebody who you want to share that file with, and um, and then there's a, a rendezvous server, and then you um, and then the then your encrypted file transfer occurs between you directly, I think. In any case, it's it's similar. It's similar in spirit for establishing a P2P connection. And also like totally consistent with eventually using this mechanism for um bootstrapping off of other messaging platforms where you already have a connection to some, a credible connection to your peers. The idea of course being that you eventually use the pet demon as your one and only communication channel to all of your people. <laughs> Since it's the only one you really can trust. <laughs> Yeah, if anybody wants to start thinking about writing the contact list manager or uh, <laughs> or chat on top of pet demon, that's those are obvious next steps. And the roguelike. Yeah, and and, and a mud and yeah, as as one does. <laughs> We've done this before. We're gonna do it right this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah roguelike celebration was this last weekend and i once again was unable to participate fully but i miss it dearly <laughs> I, I i do a thing every december this is very tempting <laughs> you do a thing in december so, so it's not NaNoWriMo, it's not Fonttober. What, what is the thing that Jazz does in December? Jazz hangs out with himself in December. Well, it's at uh, Advent of Jazzier. That's what happens. And <laughs> I, I see. Last year it was Advent of Code, but done entirely in Google Sheets. That was a bad year. <laughs> 
I got to day seven, I think. Uh, after that, it was impossible. Well, I'm sure it was possible for other people. I could not do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, you know, it sounds like we've cooled off on topics. So uh... I, we, we can... Um... I have a question about endo, but I, I it can wait till later. We have time. Um, so, what is the objective of endo? This sounds like something I should have asked much earlier. There, uh, as with anything that one wants to make and is desperately trying to motivate, I have different answers depending on who's asking. <laughs> I wear many hats, so you can give me two or three. Answers. Yeah, uh, the project, uh, the the first motivating use case for the pet demon two years ago was to give MetaMask a place to stand to have an execution environment outside of the Chrome extension for snaps, given that they were not going to be able to evaluate permission that have permissionless evaluation of snaps. Um, my current understanding is that MetaMask is has retreated to a middle ground for the moment that somewhat undercuts that motivation. Um, and that is that uh, they that there's an arrangement where all of the third party extensions to their extension, Google is allowing them to effectively sign all of uh, MetaMask is going is going to be Google will permit MetaMask to sign their the third party extensions to their extension, such that they can evaluate continue to evaluate snaps. Something I like did that. not know that. Uh, this, this this I am. Um, I think it's slightly different than that. So I think the final argument is that the. Uh, execution environment that was built for snaps, <clears throat> which is. Uh, uh, assess compartment within an iframe uh, is allowed because the iframe is uh, in a page, like uh, a page that has an address online. Uh, so it's not uh, formally a part of uh, the extensions execution. Right. Okay. So and the fact of it back. being a page uh, that is uh, being loaded by the extension uh, in something, I don't want to elaborate on that part, uh, and not in an actual browser tab is not uh, undermining that. I see. That is different than the story I gleaned from Dan and totally inconsistent with I just well, what I just said. So that is more like what I understood it to be that the, that MetaMask has found a different middle ground than I just described. The middle ground where they are running third party code, um, where they are, uh, where their users are obliged to trust. MetaMask to host this third-party domain and trust that it's not subverted in order to um, that it, it, it extends the trusted part, portion of MetaMask from the extension to also this domain that's fetched over the web or the, the traditional web. Um, the What the pet demon would allow them to do instead is allow uh, is, is to uh, put an executor on their on uh, in, invite the user to uh, to install a pet demon user agent branded as a MetaMask application on their own machine and then thereby completely cut out SSL T, whatever TLS whatever um, and and MetaMask's obligation to host a site. Um, the that yeah so that is that has been undercut. That's that is no longer the motivation. The next motivation, the, uh, the motivation it doesn't mean it's not going to happen eventually. <laughs> it doesn't mean that the, it, that doesn't mean that MetaMask wouldn't be happy to see that become an option for sure. Um, the uh, in, and I my understanding is that MetaMask is very excited about having the pet demon as an option in the future. I'm uh, 
I am excited by the possibility and Aaron is, I think, evaluating the possibility. I know Dan Finley is evaluating the possibility that the pet demon could be a snap or a prototype of a next generation wallet um, that uses pet names as the basis for permission management. Um, so one answer to that question is, hey, maybe that is this is the basis of the next generation of the MetaMask wallet or another app similar adjacent to the MetaMask wallet. The um, the uh, but that's long term for sure and very uncertain. In the short term, um, getting the pet demon to run in a web page and getting the pet demon to run in various environments could be beneficial for educate so so an agoric if, if if i'm asking some if i'm if, if someone at agoric asks me this question there are two answers one of which is can i can we have a tool that explains what and so the pet demon isn't endo the pet demon is an assemblage of the components that are endo um which are also the components that are used to build the agoric uh, smart contract system right um, it's the foundation, it, 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 it's, it's, it's closing the gap and making credible the claim that an Agoric contract is just JavaScript with some DeFi APIs on top of it. That's currently somewhat untrue because there are eventual send and cap TP and orthogonal persistence and things like that that go that we would like to be just part of JavaScript. Um, in order to make them just part of JavaScript, we need to build a tool that effectively communicates that to people who are not interested in the chain. Um, so having the pet demon, so an objective for the pet demon is to create an educational platform for the components of our smart contract system that lie below the smart contract system and have a much broader applicable re re uh, reach for creating decentralized cooperating applications. Um, so that that's, I think those are, I think I've covered most of the motivating use cases. Yeah. Uh, cool. Um, and, and so like, how does Endo tie with SES, for example? The hardened JavaScript is the foundation, right? Basically, uh, these are all tools. I, I like to think of, I like to think of, uh, promises, weak references, weak map proxy, uh, the meta object protocol, all of these things that we've achieved over the last 10 years as the first layers of endo, right? They were all motivated so that we could build a thing like this. Uh, or, or the or, or the agoric chain for that matter, which we which we hadn't until recently even imagined. <laughs> um, but uh, but disrupt uh, Mark, this is realizing Mark's dream of disrupted and robust composition is definitely all all the 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 motivating use case for a lot of these things. And and on top of that, we have eventual send, which we haven't gotten into the language, hardened JavaScript, which we haven't gotten into the language. Um, uh, yeah, and at, 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 at the risk of going into uh, podcast interview mode, uh, so many of these things I understand. What is meta object? Oh, man. the meta, the, the meta. So you're familiar with it, the uh, just under different names. So uh, all of the reflection in JavaScript, uh, the object dot uh, get own property descriptors, oh, awesome. the um, and the, the the corresponding reflect dot stuff. Yeah. Um, and the, the proxy traps are kind of going in the other direction, but together, these are all uh, reflection. And the thing that's fairly unique about the JavaScript reflection compared to other languages with reflection is none of the reflection APIs compromise object capability safety. None of it is encapsulation, by, is enca encapsulation violating. The Java reflection, for example, which came earlier, 
it was all like massively unsafe. And then they had to layer another layer on top so you could suppress the unsafe things. Um, um, Mark, since I have you here, I'm going to ask this question, which has bothered me greatly. And I don't know the answer to this question. So uh, let's say we had all of this. There are also things that are not virtualizable. So like top and... Um, I'm sorry, like what? What was the first one? Oh, uh, top. Uh, uh, Spell win, that? Win, Window.top, T-O-P. Oh, 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 oh. And, um, and then also post message. So these don't, the fact that they are not virtualizable does I'm not- sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Why, why are they not virtualizable? So uh, for, for so the the reason why window dot post message is not virtualizable is a very complicated thing. I, I can go into a little bit to give you a hint, but I've never been able to explain to somebody that has not tried to virtualize it why it's not virtualizable. But so uh, so so I do need, I do need that hint in order to okay. respond to. I, I will I will I will try to give that to you. So uh, uh, window dot post message is a is a is as far as I know, the only function you can call cross origin, but it does a very, uh, so so this is in browsers, right? Oh yeah, post message is a, is a browser thing. So if, if you call post message cross frame, uh, one of two things is true. Either it is a cross origin post message call, or it is a same origin post message. If it is a same origin post message, then you can virtualize the other side and almost everything is fine. Um, a post message also passes as the second argument, the origin uh, as uh, uh, the second argument to post to the message that is received on the other side is origin. Uh, if you call it cross origin, then uh, then you can virtualize all you like on the other side, but uh, the but the browser will call the actual post message. And these two things combined make it very difficult to virtualize post message. And I, I really I have a I have a concrete example, but it's not it's not distilled well, but this is this is this is the hint. Okay, so so let me let me make sure I understand some of the structure of the hint because I think it's different than what I, I took you to mean at first. Okay, um, the uh, you're talking about virtualizing one side, assuming that the other side is using the actual post message. Oh, uh, you um, can you can virtualize both sides. Yeah. So, for example, if you're, um, you know. If you're simply on a different host, a non-browser host, and you want to create a virtualized browser environment, so JavaScript code thinks it's running in a browser with multiple origins and post message, yep. there's nothing that about you know post message or JavaScript that prevents you from emulating the browser environment so that you can run browser code on a non-browser host, correct? That, 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 is, that is true, yes. It's a, it's okay. a lot of work, but it's just work. Okay. Okay, so that so um, okay. So, to so, be clear, there so are we, objects that the mop can't emulate, like document dot all. If I'm not mistaken, so so, so that those are the other ones, do, right? So, doc, doc, uh, document dot all, document dot all, absolutely. That's yeah. a that's a no that's a known word. Um, uh, what are uh, there should be extremely few of those. And yeah, there's there like uh, there's like six of them, I think. Like, so window dot top is the other one, right? Like, you can't monkey patch window dot top. No, but you can create. But but within a compartment, you can create. You can put a non-configurable top property on the global of compartment that does what you, you right. want. I, I I take it back. You are right about the. Uh, you are right about the compartment. Yeah, uh, virtu vir virtualizing is. Um, I think maybe we need we need some some more distinctions because yes. um, the uh, both of these are not I mean document not all is a counterexample to virtualizing but the others are not so you mean something other than what I mean for virtualizing so so uh, uh, okay I mean I'm I'm not, I'm I'm struggling for examples now but like. Uh, like uh, I think document.frames is another one that I've struggled with, right? Like, 
So that is a live object uh, that that. So anyway, let, let, let's pause on the let's pause on the ex exact examples. There's a bunch of cases where it meets the object capability requirements and then further restricts them. And like what I have struggled with is like you should like having a principle that allows me to argue with someone that says no, you should not restrict this further. It is a mistake. Like it is. It is hurting. It's hurting me, and it's actually, without you knowing, hurting you that we are restricting this further. Like object capabilities, as far as I, as far as I understand it, is a is a constraint over what you could do. What I want is a is a tension in the opposite direction that allows yes. you to say, like, no, 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 this far, but no further. Right. Right. So. Um... So yeah, virtualization is actually a great example of that. You're, uh, you know, as, as um, uh, if these aren't virtualization examples, I think they're not, they still might be examples of that abstract principle. Um, the One of the things that I realized was a mistake when I wrote uh, my thesis, and uh, which I, I take to sort of be the definitive statement of the object capability model uh, is that uh, I did not make virtualizability of objects a part of the definition. And then I proceeded to show a bunch of patterns like the membrane pattern, which are only achievable if you have a, a object capability system with virtualizability. Um, uh, so, uh, so in any case, the the I'm not trying to retrofit virtualizability into definition of object capabilities. I think definition of object capability stands without it. Um, but certainly, a virtualizable object capability system uh, is a, um, a, a a a you know a lower bound, a a a um, uh, a statement of possibility rather than a statement of impossibility. Um, uh, and and enables a whole bunch of patterns that are very useful for building out an object capability system. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, um, so the kind of thing <clears throat> that you're reaching for has to do with. I'm having I'm having trouble stating it. Um, so, can, could you try to state what the examples you have in mind have in common? It is the, the case that every once in a while, no, you are you are not wrong when you say top is virtualizable in a compartment. There have been cases where I have run into problems virtualizing particular functions, and when I do, I end up having to be forced to, I mean, to hack around it, right? Like to, to, to do crappy things. But what I actually wanted was the ability to, the ability for a subsystem not to know that it had been lifted, right? Like, huh? yep. like I, I'm, try, I'm trying to use very generic words because uh, because, because the exact words all have problems, but like okay. I could not lift a system up so that it did not know that it had been lifted and then like slide something underneath it. Okay, so this is because of the absence of compartments, right? I mean, you could have done that if you had compartments. Could could I? So that's probably true. I have just it just seemed like a lot of work to like so. For 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 the DOM, the only way I know how to do that is to move the entire thing into a web worker and then proxy proxy updates into the actual DOM. I, I don't no, know. Hold on, hold on. You're the guy. You're the guy who figured this out about the DOM. I, but, it, but it was such a I mean, it was a pain in the ass to do, right? And and what I want is the browser to I, I want the browser to help, me. like I want the browser not to be my enemy 
when I'm doing this, right? Like it was like, I had to work around the browser in order to do this. Okay. Right. And, and, and I think that like, but I don't have a, I, I don't, I don't have a principled way to argue what it is that I'm trying to articulate right now. It's just like, oh, you know, like the, people will argue like, oh, for security reasons, we should do these things for this kind of reason, we should do these things. And I don't have a systematic way to say like, no, this is the principle you are violating. Uh, object capabilities gives me the principled way to argue why they should not give too much privilege away. Right. I do not have a way of arguing why they should give me a whole bunch of privilege too. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I got that. I got that. I mean, the an argument for both, you know, having a theory that gives you upper bounds and having a theory that gives you lower bounds is clearly very valuable. It reminds me about, you know, like, um, uh, you know, safety versus liveness is, you know, safety is a set of upper bounds and then liveness is a set of lower bounds. Um. We're running low on time, and I want to argue more about why pet demon should exist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you, you should do this. This is a very hand wavy argument that, that I'm having right now. Um, an argument that I haven't stated so far is uh, that another argument that I tell my coworkers at Agoric is that uh that the crypto ecosystem cryptography cryptographic currency ecosystem currently um has there's a uh it is it is it is possible but hard to connect the value of a cryptographic currency to currency to real value and part of what makes our uh, Agoric's chain interesting is that it's built off of this common foundation based off of Endo, where it becomes easier to connect value on the chain to value in the real world um, because it stands adjacent to this potent to a potentially vast ecosystem built on top of the same language and platform that uses eventual send and pet names and et cetera, et cetera, everything that pet demon stands for. Um, that isn't, that is mostly off chain, uh, that has the, the potentially to exist, but that has the potential to exist largely off chain. Um, and my hope is to use the pet demon as the basis of building out this ecosystem that is adjacent to our chain. Um, in order to bring real world to connect real world, real world value to uh, to virtual value, if that makes sense. Well. Makes sense to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it sounded like I'd killed the conversation. <laughs> yeah. Let me actually point out a, a, a further elaboration on that that we rarely talk about, uh, which is, you know, along with Nick Zabo's original smart contracting idea was also smart property. Um, and one of the places that hardened JavaScript runs, of course, is XS, which is now you know a native hardened JavaScript engine, and it's running in lots and lots of devices, uh, which are um, so having and you know those devices are or yes, thank you, and um, so those devices being able to speak um, you know TLS or other adequate cryptography, um, and running you know CAPTP on top of hardened JavaScript, uh, we can do you know, an end-to-end -end object capability fabric that's both across, you know, normal solo machines, across the chain on one end, and across lots of devices at the other end. So, so, um, uh, so that's sort of a, a further extension of, of, you know, our possibility of tying into the world is tie, tying into the actual behavior of objects. 
the, uh, objects as in physical objects. Yeah, the interesting thing about this partnership that this this emerging ecosystem that's basically starting with Agoric, Modable, and MetaMask is that we have three nodes that could potentially be connected. You can easily imagine um, <laughs> the MetaMask evolving into um, a, a home automation hub, <laughs> for example, where and and uh, and being able to stretch that in absurd ways, just like here, I'm going to sell you a capability to turn off my on, turn on and off my porch light. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is which is obviously not valuable but <laughs> um it's just the beginning of automation right i once worked uh on a system uh for home automation uh on the ui uh, layer and <clears throat> About a year after uh, doing that work, someone told me that uh, the mm, button that I had for testing was actually turning off and on the porch light on uh, the company owner's house. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't work regular hours because it was a totally side gig. <laughs> yep. So I bet someone would pay to do that as well. <laughs> I bet they would. Was was this was this Z10? Because that makes complete sense. <laughs> uh, it was a uh, it was a, s a smaller local company. They renamed at least twice, so I lost track of who they are. Um, Sorry, not Z10 X10, but yeah, they only have like two hundred fifty different, two hundred fifty six different. States. And so collisions occur fairly regularly, particularly if, yeah, right. that's cool. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Maybe this wouldn't have been a problem if that home automation system had been built on top of a fabric of object capabilities. <laughs> um, well, in any case, yeah, we're, we're at time. It's been great talking to all of you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. See you next time.